Koto Katoa. I'm Elizabeth Kerr and I have with me today soprano Jenny Wallerman who has commissioned 21 new songs by New Zealand women composers and poets. She's about to sing the complete set in their premiere performance with pianist Jian Liu called 21 by 21 at the Aotearoa New Zealand Festival of the Arts. Kia ora Jenny. <laughs> Kia ora. You told me a while ago that you had the idea for 21 by 21 in the middle of the night. Why was it 21? Well, um, the idea was stimulated by the fact that I had um, the possibility of putting in a grant application. And of course it was sort of reasonably last minute that I had to intensely think, what am I going to actually put the application in for? And so this was a, a project that had kind of been simmering away in the back of my mind for, for many years. Um, but it sort of um, coalesced into that because it had to uh, at that particular point. And I thought, I was thinking about why, um, what I could do, what we could do, what could be done about the fact that there was um, a, a, a male dominated canon of music. Um, in classical music um, and and I had started to think well what if I commissioned a bunch of songs from women composers and maybe that adds to the canon in a very small way but it you know it's something positive that you could do uh, and then the, the crazy idea in the middle of the night was that um, oh it's it's going to they're all going to be composed in 2021 and we're in the 21st century um, oh, what a great opportunity to go 21 songs by 21 composers um, and I guess the crazy part about it in a way was that I hadn't really taken into account how long that program might end up being and it's ended up being a bit longer than I expected but um, yeah, it's 21 songs, <laughs> 21 composers. And and did you anticipate when you had that bright idea in the middle of the night? <laughs> just what a big and complex project this was. Oh, no, this no, was. no. <laughs> no, if I had, had had that comprehension in the middle of the night, obviously I would not have embarked on it. Um, because, it, yeah, it, it's, there's so many different aspects of it that I hadn't thought about until, of course, I got to it. Um, and, and the biggest part, I guess, is the fact that there are 21 people to be um, working with and facilitating and, and administrating all of the things that go with that. Um, and as, as well as that, as that um, I was asking for all of the songs to be on texts by female New Zealand uh, poets or poets associated with New Zealand in some way. And um, so then I was also in touch with all of those people and yeah administrating all those things so you were adding to the canon why was it important that they were women composers uh well for anybody who's, who's not really aware of it um in the 19th century earlier um and even in the early 20th century uh women were either discouraged actively from composing or if they were allowed to compose music, it was generally not allowed to be published, either because their husband denied them that uh, possibility, uh, or for, you know, just as sort of um, societal, cultural norms, in, and I'm talking of course about European, um, uh, that era in, in Europe, um, where most of this classical canon comes from. Uh, so. Even, as I say, even in the tw early 20th century, um, there are stories that I've uncovered recently about uh, composers who, who went under male names in order to get things published, even though 
um, everybody knew it was written by that particular person. I think the, the person I'm thinking about there is, I think the name is Claude Aral, a French composer, who's actually a male name but a female composer, and she was very well known and broadcasting things right through, and I think she died in the uh, 1950s, um, but she still had everything published under a male name in order to get people to to take it seriously, I guess, and, and play it. And, it's and interesting because that happened in other art forms as well, so mm. it's interesting to know that that was happening. It seems, though, that it's kind of stuck a bit longer in classical music. It, it, yes, it's that's stayed. right, actually. It's a it lot is. more work so, to be done. So were you confident when you embarked on this that there were going to be 21 <laughs> women composers who'd be able to get involved in this project? Yes, I, I, I knew that there would be. Um, but I didn't know necessarily who they all were yet. I knew that some of them personally, I went and asked uh, lots of different people for advice, including Michael Norris, who uh, um, runs White Outer Music Press and is a colleague of mine at, uh, at the New Zealand School of Music, and is my associate, one of my associates in the project. So I went straight to him and I said, well, I've got this shortlist who you know can you add to this and do you have the contacts for some of these people that I didn't have contacts for necessarily um, and I ended up um, after talking to various other people as well with a, a list that kept on growing and it's still growing um, and is probably twice as long as that just to start with but I think we were talking before and, and you said you were surprised as I was when I started telling people about the project that they'd asked what I was doing and I'd say I was going to commission songs by 21 compo female composers from New Zealand and they'd say, are there 21 female composers? And um, I was quite shocked that n there were some people I would, would expect that from who weren't in involved in music in any particular way but um, to find that there were people sometimes who were actually in the music uh, industry if you want to call it that who would ask me that question and I'd just say yes I mean what are you going to say? Of course <laughs> plenty <laughs> not a problem in fact how long was your long list when you finally got to come? Oh uh, I like to say I think I had a, a list that was twice as long as it needed to be and I had some really difficult decisions to make about who to ask and how to go about that process um, of elimination and, and inclusion um, and I yeah sweated over that and felt bad about not asking certain people and things but um, in the end, a decision had to be made. So. Indeed. And what were your criteria? So uh, I was looking particularly for people to write songs for, as in for voice and piano. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping to find people who'd done that sort of genre of, of writing before. And uh, then I, thanks to the wonderful... Um, resources that are out there on YouTube and the things that sounds have been putting together I was able to start to look and listen to lots of works by different people and so it came down in the end to personal taste about in some cases about it's maybe this people had written that sort of music but maybe it didn't quite gel with what I was really looking for so yeah. So you're a soprano, so you were asking them to write for soprano voice and piano? Well, I knew that I was going to want to perform them all to give a premiere of um, possibility for all of these new songs. But I, my other motive, one of my other motives in doing this project really is to come up with a new set of repertoire. And so I was also really keen that the songs would be things that could uh, be sung by other voice types. So I also put to all of the composers that uh, as a concept and that I, if possible, I'd quite like to be able to print, publish them in different keys and it, where it was appropriate. Um, sometimes uh, some of the songs that came in have a very wide range, so that's just not really going to be feasible to transpose it for some of the voice types that actually have slightly shorter ranges than a soprano might. So yeah, they'll just those ones will stay in that key, but other ones we're going to publish in several different keys, or at least two different and make mm. make 
other ones available. And that's so that this repertoire can be performed not just by professionals, but by students, hopefully. Mm. Um, but yeah, not all of the songs are things that I would give to my students because they are, some of them, in high level of difficulty. Uh, because I think some of the composers knew that they were going to be writing for me to perform it in, initially, and so they took that opportunity to give me some challenges, which yeah might be a bit much for some of my students. <laughs> so you've got some very experienced composers in that list of 21, and then some people who are starting out on their composition journey, um, and so that's one kind of diversity mm. in the collection. Were there other kinds of diversity that you were looking for? Yeah, um, I put out when I first uh, sent things out to the composers, I said I'm looking to try and get some repertoire that's actually in um, Te Reo. Um, so here are some suggestions of poetry that exists that's in Te Reo. Te Reo. And, um, also was hoping to get something in um, some input from Pacifica composers um, but in actual fact um, uh, took me uh, quite a while to find female uh, Pacifica composers who were used to writing in that sort of genre. So, but you found one. I did, yeah. Yes, tell us about that song. <laughs> yeah, so I was really really excited to um, be put in touch with Ayono Manufaea uh, Aya, sorry, I don't know, um, who has written a song uh, uh, with a lovely, lovely flow to it. This is something I think that um, my students, in fact I've already assigned it to one of my students to perform, um, and it's in Samoan because she is um, of Samoan heritage, uh, and she's written a song that's um, a la Mai Moana. And it's on one level, it's talking to Moana, who is perhaps a young girl who's being talked to by her mother, and told you have a, um, a responsibility, you have a mission to in, to carry things on the cultural um, uh, ideas and concepts that I'm imparting to you. You have a mission to carry that on. Um, but also that Moana is uh, the name for the sea, the word for the sea, and that the sea connects all of the islands of the Pacific. And so it's also addressing Moana as the sea and asking Moana to do its job in doing that sort of thing. Mm. And she's a very accomplished pianist as well, she this is. composer, mm. so she's bringing a lot of different things to mm. the song. Mm. So now you're preparing a substantial recital that's going to be performed all 21 of these premieres. What are the challenges about that? Ah. <laughs> well one challenge that I've just um, had to surmount was how do you put 21 completely disparate songs together into a, a recital program that will, will work. I guess normally you come at that sort of thing from a different angle. You're thinking, I'm, I'm going to do a recital, here's all the repertoire I could choose from, and what will I choose, and then put it into order. But here I had to wait until I was given all of that music, um, and presented with it, and then learn it, and then decide what order it might go in. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so in actual fact, uh, the music was being composed, yes, during 2021. Um, various different people sent me things at different times, and, and the last things came in, in in the middle of January, due to some composers having a lot of other work to do. Um, and so, yeah, I knew that I wasn't going to get the last things until the middle of January. And in actual fact, I've only just learnt the last seven songs, but the the bulk of them, um, Jan and I were able to work on and work up, ready to record, and we recorded them for um, an audio recording in um, 
January, mm. so we had a chance to, to really work through them in there. Um, uh, and then uh, I was able to, once I'd learnt the last seven, to think, okay, how do they all fit together? Yeah. And um, yeah, so the, one of the challenges with it is um, it is a very long program for uh, for me as a lyric soprano. I wouldn't normally go out of my way to perform something that was quite this long. Um, so I knew it was going to be a bit of a, a challenge and marathon thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so what I've done with the order is also that I've put uh, the lower songs, I've tended to put them towards the beginning of the um, recital list and then the higher ones or the ones that don't include such low notes um, are towards the end. And then I had to work around how do they fit together? If I put those there and those there, um, how do the themes fit together? How does one song sound after the other? If you put, say, a song that's quite light-hearted after something that's very serious, for example, it can make that serious song seem like it's being um, treated as as inconsequential. Inconse yes. So mm. yeah, those sorts of things. You think it's going to work, and you don't know until you've actually tried it. But um, we have tried it, and it's working nicely. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And probably in the future, people will pick some of these songs to sing. They're not necessarily ever going to do them again as a whole exactly. set. Mm. Um, but yes, the, well, the big marathon is at the front end. Yes, mm. ho hopefully um, Jan and I might do it again several mm. times, hopefully. Yes. Um, but not necessarily all through in one hit maybe we do it in half and half or you know find some other way around it but yeah yeah it's a, it's a new set of repertoire that anybody can pick any particular song and do it with any other song it's it's not intended that they all sit next to each other and you mentioned themes a moment ago and did you give the composers some guidance about themes about some ideas that you had about that could be explored. Yes. Um, How did you do that? Yeah, I, I rather I didn't want to impose those concepts too much, uh, and I didn't want to impose particular set of poems on them um, because I wanted the composers to be able to be working on something that really inspired them, rather than having to do something that maybe didn't quite fit with with their ideas. Uh, so I, I gave a, a put together a sample set of poems as the very first thing, um, and because I was focusing on um, poems in Te Reo, it actually had quite a few of those poems in there. Um, and but I chose ones from that initial set to send out as a, I don't know, a set of six or eight poems that gave an idea of those sorts of themes that I was thinking of. And the themes are really um, the sorts of things that in 2021, 2022, um, are important to us mm. in society now. Um, so moving away then from, you know, there's a lot of songs, I'm thinking of things that I might set for my students as a singing teacher, there's a lot of songs that are based on Shakespeare or Elizabethan um, poems and things like that and that's fantastic that's all very well but I was really looking for things that were um, you know picking up on things we're talking about today um, so for example the Me Too movement the Black Lives Matter um, there's those sorts of things that are really to the fore now that hopefully in say 10 years time are also going to be things and, and the poems are the sort of uh, touching on that sort of subject matter that in 10 years time, 15 years time are actually still relevant. Mm. So can you give us an example mm. to us of songs <laughs> that came through those strands? Mm. So um, as I said there's a huge variety so if I go from perhaps one end of, of the the scale of, of levity to another. Um, one poem that I really loved when I heard, when I first read it, um, it's by Jenny Curtis and it's called Talking of Goldfish. And it's a really quite light-hearted poem. Um, but it's, it's rather like um, uh, Di Forella, the Trout Schubert's song, in that it's 
supposedly talking about fish, but by the end you realise it's actually talking about relationships. Um, and and along the way we, we hear about Jung, um, we try to put ourselves in the mind of a flounder and how they might see the world and would the world be flat because the flounder is flat mm -hmm. and things like that. So, um, yeah, so that was one of the so uh, poems that I put out as an example, a sample thing. And um, uh, Janet Jennings chose that one to see it and has, you know, really picked up on all those sort of elements, those... Uh, watery visual elements and things. So that's kind of, in a way, a classic sort of uh, way of approaching, well, classic sort of topic or subject matter in that it reflects that sort of Schubertian way of thinking mm. about things. Mm. Um, uh, and then maybe at, at, as a complete contrast, um, I think, in fact, it's at, going to be at the end of the same section. So I'm going to start, we're going to start one section with the Goldfish Song. And we're going to end that section um, with a, uh, and, and, and through a progression, um, it's not going to just be a sudden jarring clash, hopefully. Um, we will actually move through some other subject matter into some much more dark and deep um, subject matter. And the last song in that section is entitled Massacre. So that's actually um, the title of the poem by Tusiata Avia, and it's her response to the um, uh, Al Nur uh, mosque shootings in um, Christchurch, which, is, in, as a poem, is incredibly hard hitting. And um, Leila Adu Gilmore has. Um, picked that up and set it incredibly well uh, and um, I was just practicing it with Jian Yu today and it, we get to the end of that song each time we go wow wow you know it's it's hard to you have to almost control your own emotions in order to perform it because of what we're dealing with there. I grew up with me. The skinhead in my science class. Everybody knew him. He had a furry girlfriend for a while and wore a Nazi trench coat, which you told me was cool. Mm. So, a big impact too on the audience, obviously. Mm. Mm. Yes. So, you mentioned Lena Ardu and. Um, some of you are composers, she's one of them, are not living in New Zealand at the moment. Were there some problems with communication with people who were elsewhere? And of course there were pandemic disruptions oh, for people. Oh, just a few things like yes. that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, I think everything that could happen to any composer, you know, did happen. Um, people were uh, travelling the world during global pandemic, coming back to New Zealand for visits and then having to go back again. Um, uh, people have had COVID, people have had, um, what's it, the RS, RSV, the terrible virus mm. that was, was predominant in, in New Zealand last year. Um, so yes, but all those things have held people up at certain points, but uh, I'm just so, um, so thankful that um, they've, these 21 composers have absolutely persisted and ended up providing me, gifting me, really, with these, these works at the other end. You gave them a time limit of three minutes. Did they all stick to it? No. <laughs> <laughs> 
So that's why the program was a little bit longer than I was sort of banking on. And yeah, in some cases we were able to work out a, a way of um, shortening it a little bit, mm. and in others it just didn't make sense to shorten it. So we've actually gone with that. So the outcomes of this project are going to be a lot more than just this one substantial recital. Can you tell us how the project is going to have a much longer life? Mm. So um, we, uh, we've we started to record an audio CD. It'll be a CD in a limited um, run, but also available online as a, something to listen to as an album. Uh, and that's with Atoll, um, with Wayne Laird um, recording that for us. And so we've already started that process and hopefully we'll finish that in um, April and then release it later in the year. So that's kind of a reference point for anybody wanting to learn the songs, just a first um, hearing of them perhaps. Uh, and um, we're going to publish all of the songs uh, were through White Aata uh, Music Press and the idea with that is um, I'm quite keen to have them able to be purchased as one collection um, and, and as a printed collection because I know as someone who's a singer and a singing teacher it's really helpful to have just a book that's there and you can flip through it and go oh look I've forgotten about that song how about this one for a particular student or, or for a particular purpose so to be able to, to have it as a printed collection is important to me um, but it looks like at the moment like we might end up with two volumes mm. because there are there's a lot of music there um, and also those songs will also be made uh, available individually so they'll be downloadable um, as electronic digital files and I imagine that a full set would be downloadable as well so there's that, and then of course there's the initial performance that we're yes, going about, which today. will be online, and mm. um, and I think sounds will also capture that, and so they will also have it on their site. Um, so we're going to people are going to be able to watch videos, listen. I believe also Radio New Zealand concert will yes. broadcast the songs yes. on, um, at yeah. some stage later in the year as well. So mm. in fact, it's going to have a very long life, which is Good very fact. cheering <laughs> and exciting. Mm. So thank you very much, Jenny, yeah. and all thank the best you. for the concert itself, which everyone can look forward to and can tune into pretty soon. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thank you. Teach me to be humble, to have peace.